Hi everyone, it's Eve Bentley Blowitz from spiritgirl.com and welcome to the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today and with our very special guest, Hilary Jacobs Hendel, who is a certified psychoanalyst and AEDP psychotherapist and supervisor and has published articles in the New York Times which have gone viral <laughs> and we're here today to talk to Hilary Jacobs Hendel about her award-winning best-selling book It's Not Always Depression Listen to Your Body Discover Core Emotions and Reconnect with Your Authentic Self Hilary Jacobs Hendel welcome to the Spirit Girl podcast show how are you today I'm great, Yvette, and thank you so much for having me to talk about my favorite subject, emotions. So grateful we're here today. I'm really honored. I'm such a fan of your work. Aww. So grateful I stumbled across it, especially yeah. during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And before we dive into your book, I just want to welcome all of our global listeners and audience from right around the world. I'm super grateful you're here with us today today going to be part of this very special and informative, insightful conversation about emotions with Hillary. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. And I also just want to say hi to everybody listening out there. I wish we were all in the same room and we could just connect, look each other in the eye and give hugs because we all need those with what's going on in the world today. The main thing to know about me is I'm the daughter of a psychiatrist, which has, has mixed <laughs> mixed aspects about it. I was always interested in psychology, raised in a psychological household. But much like in the rest of the world, we didn't talk a lot about emotions. And it was mostly about oh, having some insight and awareness. I was an anxious kid, although I didn't really know it. And the way that I coped with my anxiety was really to be very productive. I was fortunate to be good at school. And so I was headed to becoming a doctor, a physician like my dad at the last minute. I changed my mind because I knew I would be too anxious dealing with people who were sick and dying. And I became a dentist. But the reason that's important is because I had a full education I had a full science education and a full education in the body and physiology and neuroscience. And then to make a long story short, I've graduated, but I didn't like dentistry, had children, was headed towards a divorce and needed to rekindle my career, dabbled in many different things. And then after 9-11, really, a friend of mine said she was going to go back to social work school to become a therapist. And I sort of... Ding, a light went off. And I was like, that's what I want to do. I always wanted to do that. And I just didn't have the confidence when I was young because I thought, what do I have to teach anybody in my 20s? And so I went back to social work school and wanted to go into private practice. And in New York City, I always care about being the best that I can be. I knew it was like, it was serious stuff to take people that are suffering and distressed and to try to help them. And I knew that there were many different ways to do that. And in New York City, where I was born and raised, psychoanalysis was the epitome. It's like if you're a dancer, you become a ballerina first to get the classic education, you know, going back to Freud and whatnot. And then by just luck, I stumbled on this whole body of academic work on emotions. A friend of mine, pretty much the same friend that I had from middle school, said there's this woman, Diana Fosha, has an interesting model that is not only based on insight and like understanding with our left brain, like just thinking, but it was based in emotions and based in the body. And my friend Heidi said, you should go listen to her. I think you'd like her. So I did. She happened to be doing a conference in New York City that was on emotions, trauma, which I had to understand what it was. I didn't really know, except that I knew the standard definition that you have one catastrophic event and it really hurts you and causes all sorts of problems. So I learned about trauma at this conference in a whole new way. We learned about attachment, the way people connect and infant child research 
And what I learned at this one day conference completely blew me away for two reasons. One, I learned a body of work about emotions that, and this triangle that I write about in the book, that the minute I saw it up on the, on a big slide in the auditorium, it's like my mental health improved. I, I was reorganized in a way where I understood that my anxiety had meaning. The depressions that I had been through were not the end of the story. They were the beginning of the story and they had reasons for being there. And I could do things in my life to ensure that I stayed more emotionally healthy. And so that was one very important thing that I got out of that conference. It was like many epiphanies. The other is that I wondered where was this education before? Why had I not seen it before? I was already 39 years old at the time. I had a biochemistry degree in college. I had been through dental school which was the same with the medical students and learned neuroscience and neuroanatomy. I'd been through social work school and was in psychoanalytic training around the time. Like we weren't learning about emotions and there was actually something to learn. And it was actually based in science, both hard science, the soft sciences of psychology. They were finding clinically as people were working with patients in these methods. At the time, I thought this is basic education that everybody should know, but they didn't. And I had no platform or no recourse. And I wasn't a writer at all at the time. And so I just went in to study that method. The method was called AEDP. That's what Diana Fosha had developed. And I went in to study that method. And I became an AEDP therapist and a teacher for others how to do the method. And then about 10 years later, from working with patients, I felt I had a story to tell. And that's when I wrote to the New York Times with an op-ed piece. And they, much to my dismay, decided to publish it. And that's what led to the book and led to the emotion education that I'm teaching now. So it was a whole kind of surprise part of my life that happened. So I've just become passionate about sharing a basic emotion education. There's just a few things that people can learn that can really make a difference in how they see themselves and how they understand themselves. And then there's much more if you want to, to really dive into it but the basic education is tremendously helpful. Oh, that's such an incredible story. <laughs> You've done so much in your life. I love how you were able to identify when you didn't really feel like a career was for you and you had the tenacity to change path. And that story in itself is incredible. So I listened to your book via Audible, which was incredible, especially when I was driving five and a half hours on the highway. What I loved about your book especially the audible, it was you speaking to myself mm. as the listener. And it was really simple to follow. It made sense. I learned so much. And so I just loved all yeah. of the stories as well with your clients and the examples even from you within your own life. When it comes to your book, it's not always depression. What does that title actually mean? It brings to mind two things. The title actually came from the editor of the New York Times articles. That's what the original article was called. It's not always depression. Sometimes it's shame. But people ask me, well, if it's not always depression, what is it? And it's life. It's that we are all humans. We are all wonderful and flawed. And we have a nervous system that is designed to pick up the outside world and the environment that we live in and other people with extreme precision. Because for humans to survive, we have to know what is safe, what is dangerous, who is a friend, who is a foe. And from the moment we're born, we are picking up the world with the senses, our eyes, our ears, our sense of touch. And that goes right into the middle of our brain and it connects to our emotions so that if something is dangerous, if we perceive it as dangerous, example that I always use is if a wild dog were to burst into our rooms, respective rooms where we are, we could pick it up with noise. We might hear rustling or growling. We might see the dog. We would pick it up. And in an instant, before we can think about what's happening, it would affect the limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain that triggers the body to 
have an adaptive action, which in the case of a threat is to run. It's not always depression is really about teaching how emotions affect us and how we have been taught to bury emotions, most of us in our society, because there was no better way to help people with emotions. But now we have a better way. And by understanding emotions, because they're very painful at times and uncomfortable, but by understanding how they work, it demystifies them, makes them a lot less scary and a lot less shameful, because we're also taught to feel bad, you know, he's an angry person, weak, or all these things that we judge ourselves because we were taught that. There's a whole other way to approach ourselves and then to use our emotions. One of the things when you were saying that you were listening and that there were stories in the book and that it was simple to understand, because I just wanted to let people know that I really wrote it so that a 15-year-old and older could understand it without jargon, because I'm really wanting to be a good teacher. And the reason the book is mostly stories is because of the fundamental problem with emotions is that we cannot think our way through an emotion. Emotions have to be experienced. And what that means is we have to feel them and we have to be able to name them and sense the impulses and the sensations they make in our body. And that these sensations are meaningful because they're pulling for actions. An emotion, it triggers the vagus nerve, which is the largest nerve in the body. And if people out there want to Google an image of the vagus nerve, it connects to the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the kidney, I mean, everything. And so emotions, that's why we feel them so intensely. They affect everything. And so because you can't think your way through an emotion, a book is an intellectual endeavor, but stories are evocative. And so I wanted people to be a fly on the wall to see how one processes an emotion. If you choose to not bury it and block it, which is ultimately what causes anxiety and depression, but to be with it with compassion and curiosity and let it move through us up and out, needed to show that in a way people could experience it, a vicarious experience. And then of course, you know, those little exercises at the end to dip the toe in the water, but the stories are the main thing that help people get what I'm trying to explain. I love the stories because it felt like I was part of yeah. the therapy session and it was just so interesting. One of the things in your book was you talked about the change triangle mm -hmm. and that being a pivotal tool. What is the change triangle? It's a diagram, an inverted triangle. I would encourage people listening and watching to see if you can bring it up on the internet, just pictures of it that I've put everywhere. So you can Google the change triangle or my name. And basically it is mapping. If you think of, the, of a triangle with the point of it being in your body, somewhere midway between your heart and your stomach, and then the flat side kind of coming above your shoulders. On the top of the triangle, on the two corners are defenses, which we're defining in a very loving, compassionate, and actually celebratory way as the genius creative ways that we protect ourselves from emotional discomfort. So on one side, we have defenses, and they range from grabbing for a drink or a drug or avoiding or denying or working too much or eating too much or eating too little or working too little. Or, you know, there's a huge list. I have all of these under the toolbox section of my website. I have lists of defenses so that we can start to recognize them. On the top of the triangle are defenses and these things called inhibitory emotions, like anxiety, guilt, and shame, which I don't think there's any one of us listening that don't understand anxiety, guilt, and shame. They don't feel good. And both of those defenses and anxiety and guilt and shame serve to push down or obscure what's actually happening in the body. So at the point of the triangle, and it's in the body on purpose, are these things called core emotions, which are these evolutionary survival programs, if you will. I'm going to tell you the core emotions now so that everybody knows them. Anger, sadness, fear, disgust, joy, excitement, and sexual excitement. And it's not that there aren't other emotions. We love, we have jealousy, we have all these things. But these core emotions, there's a small subset. Each one is much designed like an on-off switch to alert you to something that's either 
you're being attacked, something is scary, something is toxic to you, or something is good for you, and you move towards it. So you can think of it as very simple that these core emotions make your body move either away from things that feel bad and towards things that feel good. So those are the three corners of the triangle. And then there's this place that's underneath the triangle which is a state of calm. It's called the open-hearted state of the authentic self. And what it means in science is your nervous system is calm and regulated, meaning that you can feel your feelings, but they don't send you off into the stratosphere of being so upset that you can't think. So you can feel, you can think, you can connect with others at the same time. And it's characterized by these C words that I learned from Richard Schwartz, who does this type of therapy called internal family systems. And the C words, again, what we're trying to get to, calm, confident, courageous, connected, compassionate, curious. And this triangle model, we are all rotating on the, the three corners and underneath throughout the day and throughout life. And we want to be able to know when we're in a defensive state, when we're in an anxious or ashamed or guilty state, when we're having a core emotion. And then when we have a core emotion, we want to be able to move through it down back to that calm state. When we have a core emotion, you're really at a fork in the road. You can either bury it like most of us do, or we can be with it. And the book is teaching people how to be with it. And what ends up happening is that the defenses are the symptoms often that people come into therapy with. So I think one of the reasons this triangle resonated so much is I went through two major depressions, one in my 20s and one in my 30s. And I went to a psychiatrist like I was told to do. And I went on some Prozac for six months like I was recommended to do. Thank goodness for that. It helped with the depression and I could get back to being functioning again. I still was like mystified and in the dark. I, I knew that I now had to take better care of myself, but I didn't really know what that meant. Not getting too much stress, of course. But what does it really mean? And it was really through working this triangle, as I call it, noticing what was happening and then labeling my feelings and then being able to move through my feelings and make use of them. That That's what this is all about, is how do we use emotions the way that they are meant to be used as signals and information, and then how do we move through them to get to a better place, whether it's in a moment throughout the day or over the trajectory of our lives as you work the triangle again and again, you really change the brain in all sorts of positive ways and wow. the body and we feel better. I have to say that by discovering your work, discovering the change triangle and listening to your Audible book, I was blown away myself because first of all, I didn't even know we had core emotions. Right. I didn't Who know knew? that. <laughs> and I didn't even know what are inhibitory emotions and what are defenses. So I grew up in Australia and it might have been a cultural thing. The notion was if you feel stressed out, like try to deal with it yourself, you push it down. Right. Or you either, if you had a bad day at work, you would come home and have a glass of wine. Right. And all of these techniques I've learned don't really help. <laughs> didn't help me in my situation. The alcohol made me feel more depressed, the yeah. pushing down, the emotions were still there. Right. When you described all of this that was happening with the core emotion, inhibitory emotions, defenses, how to not think your way out of it was one yeah. of the key take home because mm -hmm. I felt that we can get into that habit of thinking our way out of it. You taught us throughout the book, how to identify. For our listeners who haven't read the book yet or listened to Audible, how can they identify their emotions? And it's not always easy. And a, a lot of the times it depends on how much adversity we've experienced throughout our lives. Because if we were young and we had a lot of adversity, meaning anything from poverty to parents not being mentally well, abuse, neglect, bullying, all those things. The younger we are and we have 
intense emotions, it becomes overwhelming and we move into defenses to survive. And thank goodness we have these defenses because we needed them and we still need them. We just want choice and flexibility. Delivering the message of emotions in our world is not an easy thing because people want to move away from emotions. And so what I want to clarify is it's not just about being with emotions and wearing your heart on your sleeve, that we do need to think. It's that most therapies, and like you said, where most of us are raised where we're we're sort of forced up into our head with avoidance or distraction. And what we want to do is now just come into balance because our head is connected to the body and emotions are physical experiences. The way that I work in a session is if there's an emotion, we pay attention to the emotion. And this goes back to the question about how people can identify an emotion. It's really resisting the natural inclination to go up into the head. So let's say you feel a trigger or something happens, right? Maybe your boss is critical. Maybe your partner is critical or doesn't do something you ask and you feel that jolt, right? It's like you're, you were okay. You're going along and all of a sudden mm, that doesn't feel good. And so the idea would be to, instead of going up into the head, to scan the body or even thinking of it as the mind and the body, but not leaving out the body. If you can, some people cannot tune into the body because there's too much in there that they are not familiar with and they can't do this as self-help, but many people can scan the body. They can read the book, do the exercises and get an inkling of what they're feeling. Let's say my partner insults me. I all of a sudden have a feeling, I tune in and I'm like, you know what, I think I'm angry. So the first thing would be to spend some time and we have to slow down. This is the most important thing. When we go up in our head, everything gets fast. When we work with emotions, we have to pull ourselves almost. That's what it feels like. Pull back, slow down to a snail's pace. And you can learn skills and tools to do that, like feeling your feet on the floor, and moving into deep belly breathing, which are all little techniques that anybody can learn. And again, they're all in the toolbox, on the website, and I talk about them in the book. But you do need to learn some tools and techniques to slow down, to get reacquainted with your, your inner landscape. And most people can have a sense of, I feel angry versus I feel sad. Um, some of the emotions can be confusing, like the difference between excitement and anxiety. Those two can feel, but joy, people can usually, if you tune in, there's some signs inside your body. And then if you have a sense of what you're feeling, you want to just be able to put a word on it. Going back to anger, I might just scan my body and say, you know what? I'm angry. Then I would say to myself, I'm angry. That alone can be very helpful because you're putting left brain language on a right brain bodily process. The human nervous system likes that. We want to make meaning of what we're experiencing. So we, we can put language on a feeling that might feel like just a little dropping down into something that feels okay. That's what's going on. And then you want to really listen to that anger and see what it's telling you. Maybe it's saying, you know, I was insulted. I don't want anyone to call me names. That's right. We should not be calling each other names. And then you might take that angry feeling and think about, well, how can I use this constructively? And then I might say, okay, I'm going to set a limit and say to that person, I know you're trying to tell me something constructive, but I don't want to be called a name. So once you call me a name, I'm going into this fight or flight pattern. I can't even hear what you're saying anymore. So that's an example. And in terms of naming the different feelings, I think just seeing the core emotions, like I will ask somebody when they're having some anxiety, because anxiety is usually what people feel. And then it's doing some breathing and slowing down and actually tuning into the anxious feeling like in your chest or in your stomach, again, which is counterintuitive. This hurts. It feels tense. I want to move away. I want to move into my head totally natural. When you get some basic education, the instruction is to turn in gently with a loving, curious, compassionate stance, just around the edges if, there's, if it feels intense. Slow down and just be there. 
with the anxiety. And if you breathe and are still, it may just naturally calm because that's what happens. And particularly if we do deep belly breathing. And then once we're a little calmer, we can really ask ourselves like a multiple choice question. Am I angry? Am I sad? Am I disgusted? Am I afraid? Am I excited? Am I joyful? Am I sexually excited, depending on what's going on? And we can have more than one emotion at the same time. And that's also what creates anxiety. And we can have intense emotions that range from a little bit to a lot. And we can have opposite emotions at the same time that really cause anxiety. Because I might have an emotion like love that says, I want to be near you. Like a child with their mother, for example. You're my mom. I'm drawn to go near you when I'm afraid. But if my mother is scary, it's a tremendous conflict for a child. So if my mother is abusive and scary, there's going to be a part of me that's natural built in that wants to go to my mother for comfort. But if my mother is the one who is causing the distress, then my own emotions like fear and anger are going to want me to move away. And you can't do both at the same time. So there's a huge conflict creates anxiety. And the way we help ourselves is by going inside on our own with a therapist, a counselor, anyone, friend, you read the book together and you work through the exercises, classes, not groups. And we can say, okay, I know now as a child that I had this fundamental dilemma. I had love for my mother and I feared her. And then you have to process each emotion. You know, if we're talking about historical trauma and we're defining trauma now as little events or big events that caused overwhelming emotions in the face of too much aloneness. And we couldn't handle the emotions because children and babies need a caring adult for soothing. They don't know how to soothe themselves. And if the adults around them do a good enough job, they grow up to be adults who can self-soothe. Not totally because we always need people. We're just wired for connection. Our nervous systems are wired to soothe each other, which is a beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing that. That was so interesting that the first step is actually to slow down. Yes. And to come back into the body. Yes. And to feel the body. Yes. Because what I've noticed is sometimes when we're feeling anxious within, yes, we want to avoid taking a moment just to stop Yes. And to feel in. And that's one of the things I've learned through your book and through your work is that's the moment to actually just slow down. Yeah. And to notice, feel your body and to just pay attention and to feel into it and to figure out what you're actually feeling and why. Because if you don't, that anxious feeling just stays there all day. You're trying to think your way through it. You're trying to keep busy with work. You're doing this, you're doing that. But that core emotion, it's sitting in there. That's what I learned through the change triangle or through even your technique of just slowing down, pausing, breathing, taking a moment. As an example, there were all of this conflict going on with the community about mandates and this and that. And I'm thinking, what's really getting me upset here? What's frustrating me? Like, why am I feeling such a core emotion? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure it out. And then I thought, I'll just take a moment, stop, pause. And then I thought, ah, now I know. It was triggering some, I guess, past trauma or systemic cultural things with me being Aboriginal where I'd learned from a very young age how if you were Aboriginal then the law enforcement or the government could tell you what to do and what not to do so Mm -hmm. mandate policies that might not be in the ancestors best interest they had no choice but when I could sit with what am I feeling Mm -hmm. so sadness towards their story or how they were treated and then it was just a reminder of how anyone in power can make decisions 
based on what they want. Yes. And it doesn't necessarily mean we as people necessarily have such a great choice in that. But it was just a trigger of, I guess, systemic past trauma. Yeah. That is very generational. Yeah. And at times you can really feel that suffering, uh, that immense suffering was just that very systemic history that you don't even realize that it would affect you, but it can. Yeah. But by sitting with it and figuring it out, mm -hmm. I was able to get to the core of it. Yeah. Okay, I'm feeling angry because, yeah. you know, there are some people that want choice and they don't have it. And then I'm also for sadness because yeah. historically Aboriginal people have had many policies that haven't always been in the best interests of the people. So if we reflect on the stolen generation um, or the segregation of trying to get rid of the race, basically. Right. Or to Europeanize it, to create really great Aboriginal people into European people, which unfortunately hasn't been the greatest outcome because we're not wired innately to drink alcohol mm -hmm. and it really does cause a lot of um, addiction and mental health issues mm -hmm. but we were taught as Australians in society to if you get stressed you just have a drink after work and you deal yeah. with it like that but I feel that the change triangle for anyone is just so beneficial especially when there's so much going on in the news. There's so much going on in the communities. It's so diverse. Everybody has a different opinion. Like no one right now is on the same page. So the change triangle or understanding our core emotions or inhibitory emotions or defences is such a timely gift that you are giving to us, Hillary. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that if I could have learned all of this in school, yes, that would have been incredible. Yeah, I, I totally am with you. And you're talking about racial trauma. It's not so easy to work with one's emotions. But the first step is to at least have the education, right? I wonder what it would have been like if we were all educated in the change triangle and we understood that we had defenses and we understood that we had core emotions and we understood that anxiety meant that that was a signal that we had to take care of our emotions and tend to them. And if we all had a common language to be able to say, hey, you know, I know that you're like a teenager, you know, you're, you're being mean to me, your mother, or you're doing all these things, but I know like it's because you're suffering. What's going on? Can you tell me about it? How we'd all have just a, a much better world. The triangle, there's no goal. You work it. It's a tool for the rest of our lives. And I also feel so lucky that I had it. So it's not that you stop feeling bad or that certainly you don't stop having emotions because emotions just are, they're wired in and they're doing their job when we feel them. But it's that there's something positive and constructive that can be done. And I don't even see how people have good relationships without understanding emotions. Like when you cohabitate with someone, like especially with quarantine and what we've all been through with COVID. I mean, it's so hurtful what's gone on for humanity to be isolated and trapped. Talk about triggering. So just at least understanding that, for example, for people listening, if you leave with nothing today, except knowing that, that core emotions just are, that you're not bad for having emotions, you're not weak, don't, you don't have to ever judge yourself ever again for having an emotion not for having an emotion. Do We have choice about how we respond, how we act, our behaviors, that we must be accountable for. But just the experience, which I like to break down, especially with anger, we need to be able to experience anger, which is a totally internal process. There's no action. And then once we understand what happened to us, we then we think through is there a course of action? Do I need to set a limit or, or do I need to say no? Or is this something that's from the past? Like you were saying, we're wired in our experience from the time we were born. And so the experiences that we have as a child, we grow on top of those experiences and they like echo. Like you mentioned about authority 
if, if the government did bad things when you were younger, you might be sensitive to any type of authoritarianism presently because it's bringing up those past feelings. And then even just being a kid with parents, they're authoritarian, right? Our parents tell us what to do. And if they're very domineering, we might just grow up with the don't tell me what to do mentality. I don't even care if it's good for me. Don't tell me what to do. That would be a defense because what's going on underneath it would be, you know, I have anger from back then and I need to process the anger. And I had sadness because I wasn't seen and the loss of somebody connecting to me and knowing what was going on and caring about me is a real loss. Uh, and I get triggered to fear easily when somebody behaves in a certain way because it's old fear and I need to move through that. When you talk about emotions, we're sort of time traveling because we don't know that an emotion is picking up something from the past until we understand that that happens. And we read a few stories to explain the link. And then we can stay with an emotion. Actually, the body is the archive of our history. And the body never lies. Our thoughts will lie to us, tell us we're no good or unlovable or but our body doesn't. And, and that's how I work with people's will stay with an emotion, particularly if I have an inkling that this sounds like old stuff through the emotion, the memories will spontaneously arise. Like I show in the book, we're processing a childhood memory of that emotion. And then all of a sudden the brain rewires and the present day is much easier because we're not triggered in the same way over and over again, like a broken record. So it's really to get unstuck. Emotions are the key to that. You just can't really think your way out of these things totally. You really, it's got to be working with emotions. That is incredible how you talked us through that. And it was in that moment, I remember being like a little kid and maybe seeing all the video footage around the stolen generation, even show me places where the children got taken to. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. and you might see something in the news where you know, people might be upset with the mandate for whatever reason. You forgot about all those stories mm -hmm. when you're a kid, but it gets triggered. So I love how you have the change triangle, which is to be used forever because this is an emotional health tool and every day is completely different. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be something coming up. Yeah. Whether you have a breakup, whether you've lost your job, whether someone's disappointed you, there is just so much stuff that happens in our life. And good things too. One of the hardest things you think it might be hard to process sadness or anger, give someone a compliment and you will watch the way that the defenses pop in. Oh no, shrugging. No way. Oh, you know, no, you're the one that's fabulous good feelings we bury and block almost as much maybe even more sometimes that it's very hard to let an expansive feeling because feelings like joy and gratitude and love and excitement they feel big in the body and if we feel them it's very vulnerable because we we're bigger we're like bigger targets in a way many of us are used to staying small but that's another way to help people feel more vital, less depressed, is you don't necessarily have to even go so-called negative emotions. In those moments, right, we're not conjuring phoniness. In a moment where there's a, like even a little molecule of joy, you can do an exercise. Um, there's a change triangle YouTube where I walk people through these little experiential exercises. but I can stay with a good feeling. Like maybe someone said, oh, they like the book. Maybe like you, I could stay with my experience with you. Notice what it feels like in my body and just breathe. And if you breathe and focus, focusing is like a, a surgeon's scalpel. When you focus on what you want to change or be with or expand, that's the key. Change triangle is like mindfulness with a map in a way. So we focus on a good feeling, slow down and breathe and just notice the sensation and how it will move. And likely it'll move a little bit and then we'll shut it down with anxiety because we'll be like, well, this feels weird. But then you practice like building muscles at the gym a little bit every day, letting the good feelings nourish you. So you really experience. So next time someone pays you a compliment, if you can take two minutes 
just to notice it in your body and breathe into it and enjoy it because those moments, you know, aren't always so plentiful. I love that. And I've got an exam day. So I go into the coffee shop and the barista says, oh, I love your dress. And I go, oh, it was only $24.99 from Valley Girl. Yeah. And he goes, you don't need to tell me the price. It looks more expensive and it looks lovely. Just take the compliment. I took a moment and I thought, why did I say the price? And I'm standing in the line, just kind of like feeling into this, which you've taught us, me now, all of us. <laughs> but I'm feeling into it and I went, ah. Oh. That's right, because we always used to get hand-me-downs as kids. So our clothes were Mm hand-me-downs. So now I'm buying these clothes. Once again, I'm going back to my childhood. Yes. Didn't take the compliment. So I'm going to learn in that moment when I get triggered just to say thank you. Right. And before the thank you, well, thank you is lovely. You could spend a little bit of time with it, or you could leave and go home later and spend a little time because it's quite insightful, Yvette. And I would even say there's another emotion that I'm very into and teaching people about, and that is shame. And shame is an emotion that nobody really likes to talk about. And even the word shame can make people cringe. But it's a very fascinating emotion. And when you learn about it, like when you learn about everything, it kind of demystifies it and desensitizes it. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because it's more than what we're sort of taught about it in society. And you can think about it in that moment when you got the compliment, there was a lot going on. So I can, the way saying the price was one, you didn't want him to maybe think that it was some fancy dress because that might bring up some shame because it was so fraught. I love hand-me-downs, but I loved them by choice. I didn't have to have. Shame is like when I have too much or I have too little, I feel shame. And when someone compliments me and I feel bigger, I might collapse in shame because of of the feeling that it's not okay to feel good about ourselves because we're taught basically that it's not okay to feel good. We're called conceited and we're called braggarts and all these names. And yes, there is such a thing. Again, it goes back to behavior. We're talking about just between you and you having the nice feeling. And then a thank you. That's very nice behavior. If you walked around saying, great, you know, I look great. I'm better than everybody else. That is arrogance and conceit, right? That's not what we're after. But it's okay to feel okay about ourselves. There's, there's lots to learn. There's a lot of nuance. in. there's a basic education here that's really helpful. I guess that's what I always come back to. I really encourage everybody to learn about emotions. And it doesn't even have to be through my book. It could be anywhere and to keep learning. Yeah, well, you're doing some incredible courses coming up in next year. You've got your two-day weekend class, Emotions Education 101 on Zoom, which will be on the 26th and the 27th of February in 2022 next year, which I loved. And you're also doing the eight-week course yeah sadly these are in in eastern time oh oh, actually in australia if the the wednesday eight-week class starts at three o'clock my time so that's probably oh it's like early in the morning it's like six in the morning but doable before work i I really think for the listeners out there listening to the book or reading the book whatever people prefer and using the little snippets my blog stories never go out of favor. They're just relevant to different aspects of emotion and trauma and relationships. And for people interested, if you want to give me your email, once a month, I don't spam people. Once a month, I send a new article and I take requests. And I just really love teaching people about emotions. That's sort of my, it's like a hobby. I love writing. My psychotherapy practice is my bread and butter but creating resources and helping people understand emotions. And then um, they do with it the information of whatever they want. Maybe you just intellectually want to understand emotions and you never want to work with them. 
that's fine, but at least it will help you understand other people better. And maybe you want to just do a little of the self-helpy exercises in the back of the book, and that's fine. Or maybe you want to find an AEDP therapist that can really go deep with you into your emotional world and help you process the wounds from the past. One feels in the way of moving forward in the direction of, of your dreams, and or you don't feel vital enough and you want more energy. Because yeah. emotions, when we push them down, it zaps us of energy. It takes energy to push emotions down. And when we allow ourselves to feel our feelings, then the emotion is, can be used for engagement in the world. Yeah, well, I totally recommend everybody grab a copy of your book mm. or listen to it on Audible because for me, I've learned so much. And it feels like every day now I'm kind of trying to check in with myself, identify it label it work out what's going on what's coming up yeah and then discovering what are my defenses why is this coming up what can i do here and it's much more easier now to figure out what's going on within within the body mm -hmm. and how i'm feeling and why i'm feeling that and what is it associated to? So it's an incredible tool, Hillary. Jane really Kendall. Your yeah. book is just yeah. so amazing. The stories in it, it's so incredible. So I totally recommend Love everybody grab a copy and stay connected with you. Hillary, before we say goodbye, because I could talk to you forever mm -hmm. and I'm conscious. But you give so much. You're always helping people. You really want to get this message out there about emotion and the change triangle just to help everybody within their overall emotional health and well-being and mm -hmm. within their life. Yeah. And obviously, once we know how to do the change triangle, this can really help also with suppressing and addiction and all of these things numbing out through social media you give so much but how do you take care of your own self and what are some of your own self-care rituals well as you can imagine i use the change triangle pretty much every day and i'm very good at taking care of myself i'm really good at setting limits and boundaries because as a therapist, don't, you know, to be a good therapist, you have to take good care. So you show up feeling, you know, very engaged, right? So some of the things I love hot baths, if I have a stressful day, and I just really feel awful. Delicious smelling bubble bath. I love grapefruit smells. There's a company called Fresh here, and I use their grapefruit bubble bath and, and a very hot bath what I would call like a real state changer, as I say, it's like go into the bath feeling one way, come out feeling another way. Of course, I like to exercise more and more as I get older because I'm getting stiffer. I mean, I have, I have a wonderful husband. It's a second marriage and uh, we both found each other. He was in therapy a million years. I was in therapy a million years and we just wanted somebody that we could like process, talk about emotions with and be with our feelings and soothe each other. So um, it would be wonderful if everybody had a loving part and, and sat. It's not so many. And I do think it helps the more that people develop self-awareness and have a common language to talk about emotions to recognize again as we said in the beginning when somebody is in a defensive mood because we all behave badly we all get irritable and that never goes away because we're humans the more tools you have to connect it's tremendously helpful wow. those are my main self-care and a delicious meal i love to eat <laughs> and i love a good drink too <laughs> Oh, I love that. And everything in moderation. That's what I <laughs> It's so lovely to find out more about your self-care rituals. And yeah. what is your hope now for your newfound book readers or Audible listeners? Mm -hmm. my, my hope is that they will learn something that they will be able to use and that will make people feel better about themselves and curious without judgment to know themselves and I really do think that the information and the work on emotions helps us less judgmental of each other as well. And self-judgment goes hand in hand with judging others. When people are judging others, you know, in a session, I sort of know the answer to this question now before I answer it, but I will say, are you this hard on yourself? And they're like, oh, I'm much harder on myself. So when we can learn to be gentle and, and curious and compassionate with ourselves, it goes hand in hand with learning to 
not cut people if they're abusive, right? There's there's certain hard lines in these everyday living together skirmishes with people to cut a little slack and say, you know, are you okay? Seem a little irritable. What's going on? A little more critical these days. You know, what's going on? Just something to get a little bit below and not take the bait. Like we're fighting in our society, the social media stuff, and even wars that you know men have largely created. It's like I believe emotion education is the solution, the beginning of the solution to people stopping behaving badly. And everybody needs basic safety, food and shelter, so that they're not triggered to fight and flight. And then we need emotional safety. And the only way we know how to build emotional safety is by understanding how emotions work in the mind and body. So I would hope everybody would pursue a basic education in emotions and then see what happens from there. Yeah, I love that. I love mm -hmm. your hope for your newfound book readers and audible listeners. Now, Hillary, I could speak to you forever. What is the best way now for mm -hmm. our beautiful podcast listeners and audience to stay in touch with mm -hmm. you? If you want to explore the many resources on my website, and mostly they are free. I, I charge for the classes because they take up my time and the book you have to pay for, but the rest of it is, is free. So hillaryjacobshendel.com, or you can Google the change triangle. I'm everywhere on social media because that's the best way to educate people. But I would love it if people wanted to join my email list. So if you go to hillaryjacobshendel.com and you just give me your email and then once a month we'll have a connection. I'll send you an article and what's going on in terms of the world of emotion, education, classes and other free resources. And you can email me from that email. And it's it's all me. I do, it's a one stop shop. I do all this myself. So and I, I love to connect with people and help them find resources when they need. So that would be wonderful. And then on social media, and maybe one day you would do a book club with the moon. And that would be kind of cool because I do think people can get together. I designed the book. It's sort of a curriculum in itself, as you know, because there's, you learn a little bit of the science, not a lot to like make people glaze over and get so bored. I, like, I get bored easily in books and I didn't want to write a boring book. I wanted it to be like a beach read on emotion. And then you read the story to explain the point so you can see what it's like. And then there's a little exercise and people can buy the book together, husbands and wives or wives and wives and husbands and husbands and all genders in between and all groups, community groups, church groups. People can read the book together and connect authentically by doing the exercise. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of ways connect. It's a great thing. That's why the emotions education class is so cool because learning, I do a little bit of a slide presentation, like it's eight 90 minute classes and sandwiched in between me talking for 20 minutes, we go through the different parts of the triangle are two experiential exercises because again, can't think our way through an emotion. We have to have an experience and then we all talk about what the experience was like. People, we all feel so alone with our experience. We think there's something weird about us or wrong. And then you hear other people sharing and you realize, oh my God, there's a huge range of experiences. There's a commonality that we can all understand and relate to. We all have the same emotions. Every human on the planet, every gender, we have the same core emotions and they are the common denominator. So when we go beneath our differences, I know what sadness is. You know what sadness is. Mm -hmm. We both know what comfort is to be loved up and hugged or soothed or understood without judgment. And that's where it's at. I love anyone who wants to be part of the book club <laughs> and read Hillary's right incredible book. I would love, love, love that also. It's not always depression. And in Australia, it is available on Booktopia, but it is available on Amazon.com and many, many, many bookstores on about the world. And I see that it's even translated in different languages. Yes, so thrilling. It's in Spanish and Chinese and Korean and Lithuanian and Polish. And it's coming out in Japanese and Turkish soon. So there is momentum. It really feels like a grassroots movement. I'll be happy when it's taught in high schools all over the world and then I can stop tweeting and doing these posts. On these <laughs> and social media is important to both of us for our work, but it's laborious and it would be great if everyone got the basics. Yeah. Well, Hillary, thank you again for being a guest on the Spirit Girl podcast show. I'm really, really grateful and honored 
that we've had this opportunity with you and our audience. It's been an absolute pleasure. I could have had like a marathon podcast show with you, like a five-hour session, and it still wouldn't even be enough. But I'm really grateful for all the work you're doing, and it's so incredibly needed. Yeah, It's really, really needed, and especially in these times when emotions are high. But once we can figure out what's going on, it's Mm -hmm. incredible. So thank you for all the work you do. You're so passionate Mm. about helping others. And I love how your book was simple, easy, and how you did make it so that you could just be on your beach holiday reading it or by the pool. And it's coming into winter where you are, so it's a perfect time to read books. And we're coming into the Christmas holiday. Just thank you for all the work you do because you do so many podcast shows, you write a lot, you give a lot, you go above and beyond just wanting to help other people to feel good and you you just do so much and you're so passionate about it. It really comes from within Mm -hmm. and it really shines. (laughs) Thank you so much, Yvette, and thank you for the opportunity to come and share here with you and it's been a pleasure. And yeah. thank you to everybody listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Hillary. So we'll say officially goodbye to Hillary Jacobs Handel. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And I really hope that by tuning in, you have now got a greater insight and understanding about how you can listen to your body, discover your core emotions, and reconnect with your authentic self. And what we've learned is it's not 